Okay, let's talk a little bit about ductile and brittle materials. When you're uh, designing structures, there's lots and lots of different materials you can use, and uh, there's lots of different ways to think about them. One of the most fundamental distinctions we make is whether a material is ductile or brittle. And a ductile material is one that bends before it breaks, and a brittle one is a material that doesn't. It's fairly simple. Um, I've got a couple examples here. If you look at uh, this thing right here, this is a piece of just brass rod. This is actually a brazing rod, but it's a soft brass. If I grab it like this, and uh, I can bend it, and as long as I don't bend too far, it'll go back to its original shape. It, isn't, it hasn't permanently bent. Okay? If I do this, now, it's permanently deformed. When I let go, it didn't go back to its original shape. This is uh, a ductile material. It's bent, and this is called plastic deformation. Okay? This bent without breaking. Now, I already broke this because I was, this is my second attempt at this little clip. This is a piece of chalk. Now, chalk is a very brittle material. You can see I broke it right there. It broke into two pieces. You put it back together, right? And I get this together exactly the right way. There we go. And I press so that you can't really see the crack in it. There's no evidence that it's actually broken. It didn't bend at all before it broke. Okay? It broke without bending at all. That makes this a brittle material. Now we can talk about it in kind of uh, uh, imprecise terms like this. There's a, a much more uh, precise way to describe ductile and brittle materials, and that's to use a stress-strain curve. So let's draw one of those. Okay, let's try to get that straight. This axis is stress, which is the Greek letter sigma, and this axis is strain, which is the Greek letter epsilon. Okay, stress is just Force divided by area, strain is change in length divided by original length. I know this is in one dimension here. The others, stress and strain can actually be described in three dimensions. For right now, for conceptual purposes, it's good to describe things in one dimension. All right, let's start with the ductile material. I'll write that over here. Ductile materials have a, uh, a characteristic shape to this curve. It's kind of a signature. And what they look like is that. Okay? Now every material is a little bit different and this is just a nominally uh, representative curve here. Um, let's uh, look at a couple features of this curve. This part down here, let me get my head out of your way here in a second, is a straight line Okay, now I didn't draw it very straight. Let me clean that up a little bit. Okay, that's a straight line. Right? The slope of that line is E, the elastic modulus for the material. E is kind of like a stiffness. It's a material stiffness. Okay, and that, that straight line holds to about there. All right, on this side of this notional line right there, the material, the stress-strain curve, is a straight line. This is called the elastic region. And this is called the plastic region. Now, if I were king of the world, I'm not sure I would have called them this, because elastic, there's a material called elastic. It's what, you know, it shows up in clothes a lot. Plastic is a whole class of materials. This marker I'm using is made out of plastic. This is made out of plastic, that's the plastic region. The same word means two different things. You know, there's something about the way English developed, we, we tend to do that a lot. Okay. What elastic means is that materials over here have not permanently deformed yet. I've got a, my little ruler here. Um, this is just a little stick of wood I cut out. And if I press like that, okay, I can get this material to deform quite a lot, actually, and I do this way, I get it to form the other way. When I let go, when I quit applying that load, it's gone back to its original shape. It has not plastically deformed, it's elastically deformed. Elastic means it goes back to its original shape after the load is uh, uh, 
load is released, the load goes away. Plastic deformation means there is permanent deformation. You, once, when the load is released, it doesn't go back to its original shape. This is a piece of soft aluminum wire. This is also a brazing rod. And I made a little uh, fixture here. And the idea is I'm going to make a spring. Now, not a very good spring because this is soft aluminum. So what I've done is I've bent this a little loop around this, and I've got a block with two little dowels sticking out of it. So I'm going to do this. Hold this up into the frame here. And there we go. I just made a spring. All right? That's a spring. And this is almost literally how the people make springs in factories. In order to make this thing, I had to plastically deform this aluminum. But to use it, I've got this really slick little spring now, in operation it stays in the elastic region. So here's something that experiences plastic deformation being made and elastic deformation when it's being used. Now, this is a ductile material. It behaves linearly. This is a straight line. Then it goes through this nonlinear region. In this region, Hooke's law applies. Oops, let me get that right there. Stress equals E times strain. Okay? In this region, this very, very simple law applies, and we tend to do most of our calculations assuming plastic or elastic deformation because this relationship is so simple. Over here, the relationship between stress and strain is different. It's certainly possible to do calculations in the plastic region. People do it all the time. The math's just a little more complex. Okay? So this is a ductile material. In this region here, this slope is E. In this region here, the relationship is more uh, com mathematically complex. The transition between straight line and this curved line is called yield. Okay? That's the point at which the material is now going to start permanently deforming as the load increases. The ultimate here, this is called ultimate, That's the absolute maximum stress the material can withstand. It's already plastically deformed. This is it. And this is called rupture. This is when it actually breaks into two pieces. Okay. So elastic deformation, there's yield when you make the transition to plastic deformation. Ultimate, it's well into the plastic region, and then there's rupture. Okay. So let's look at now uh, brittle materials. Brittle materials are like glass and ceramic and things that that deform very little, sometimes not at all, before, or I'm sorry, plastically deform very little, sometimes not at all, before rupture. So a brittle material looks like this. And there's stress and strain. Okay? This is linear through almost all of the, the curve. Rupture's up here. Rupture and ultimate are the same thing. There is no difference between rupture and ultimate in a brittle material. And some materials, this, this nonlinear region, this curved region up there, is very, very small. For chalk, I'm guessing it's just about zero. There just about isn't one of those. Okay. Same thing applies. E is there. There's a very small or maybe no plastic deformation region. All right? Brittle materials include cast iron, heat treated steel, glass, ceramic, my piece of chalk. Let's get the piece of chalk back out. And if I get this back together again, there we go. All right. Since there's clearly no plastic deformation on this, and when you put it back together, you wouldn't know it was broken. There's really no plastic region in this chalk. Right? The mathematical definition we use is that if, if uh, failure occurs, rupture occurs, with less than 5% strain, it's assumed to be brittle. If it's more than 5% strain, it's assumed to be ductile. Now, that doesn't mean that a material that's 4.99% strain to failure and another one that's 5.01% strain to failure are dramatically different materials. That line is a very fuzzy one. 1, 2% clearly brittle, 
20%, which is possible with some mild steels, clearly ductile. Okay?